Yo, guys, it's Kyle coming at you from Bain's Film Reviews. Today, I am sitting down with Jefferson Stein, the writer, director, and producer of the short film Burroughs, a, an incredibly intimate, um, just one of the more interesting things that I've seen in a long time, and I'm really happy to sit down with Jefferson. Thank you so much for taking the time today. How's, how's everything going? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me. This is amazing. Um, Everything's going good. We are like right in the middle of, well, we've just released the film online for free for this like limited window. Oh, so great. had this whole, you know, festival kind of, you know, campaign or kind of hitting the tail end of it now. And now it's just like out there to the public as of yesterday. So uh, cool. anxious, excited, kind of like all that kind of reading the comments of people and um, everyone has this like totally different perspective of how they kind of come into it, which is really cool. Uh -huh. and, um quite expect so um it's cool it's just cool to see awesome awesome um well all the positive reception is well deserved for sure i have a review written i just have not gotten a chance to edit and post it yet but oh, I, I, yeah it's written i'm hoping to have it posted later tonight i hit i'll head from here to my second job so uh, it'll be a little bit <laughs> it'll be a little bit later tonight but awesome. that's the that's the intention um thank you so I'm, I'm always curious how did how'd you get into film in the first place um i got into film let's see the first thing i made was i would make these uh so my parents had a, a you know video camera that you could record like straight to vhs tapes oh, and cool. so that was like my grandma i think got it for us you know there's baby baby videos of me or whatever on this thing and so it was just sitting you know in in, in its just big giant kind of case and i remember getting into it when i was like maybe six years old and I really was into like airplanes. And so I like set up all the airplanes and made sort of like a video, kind of like a film about, you know, all the different airplanes, like a day at the airport essentially was like the film. Okay. You know? okay. Um, cool. So I've been making movies like this since I was a little kid. I um, I got really into acting in high, in, uh, in middle school and did a bunch of like acting classes. And then okay. at, the, okay. at the Dallas Children's Theater and, um, and I just got lucky. They, uh, they, they made a film class. They, you know, at the children's theater for the theater mm -hmm. kids, and um, got to be behind the camera. And that's when I kind of was it was a little more professional. We like build our own sets. We kind of um, did like a game show, an Alex Trebek game show, you know, okay. uh, film and things like that. So transitioned into high school where I convinced my my English teachers to let us make these like 30 minute films instead of doing group papers. And so we got kind of, me and my friends got kind of known that like at the end of, uh, you know, it was always English class. We would uh, bring my literal like com CPU computer in and hook it up and play, play the film and stuff. And so I've always been into this and I didn't ever, weirdly, I didn't ever think it could be like a career like I didn't go to, I went to college for business. I didn't, you know, I didn't really think it could be, um, I tried to do the, the sort of normal route and that just didn't, it didn't work. I was super, it was difficult. Like business school was really hard for me and I kept making yeah. films in business school. I would make ads for the business school actually. <laughs> and nice. so I ended up in school afterwards and kind of it all came full circle. Yeah. It seems like you found a way in every, every walk of life to, uh, to make film work for you weirdly yeah i just kind of kept uh it just kind of kept coming back up i guess yeah and i and i remember those camcorders with the with the vhs's i remember yeah. having the tiny vhs's and then we had special normal size vhs's yeah, that you, you the, slid it inside uh, yeah yeah there was the <laughs> what was that called high eight or something like that they had a bunch of different I would go to Circuit City with my grandma and I'd be like, please let me buy these tapes or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then how did you come up with the idea for Burroughs? Yeah, so I'm from Texas, you know, born, raised there, lived there my whole life. Um, I'm based in LA now, but I, you know, was there uh, in 2016 and uh like you know it, the border has always been the super contentious issue there uh in texas and after 2016 i felt really compelled to take it upon myself to learn as much as i could about the border and what life was like for the people who live there every day mm -hmm. and in this deep dive i discovered the tana Otha nation and um 
it was really when I learned that you know their their lands are the size of Connecticut. It's massive, and um, it actually extends into Mexico. And a lot of uh, people who live you know in cells and the surrounding communities on the nation on the U.S. side have family members on the other side. And mm-hmm. after 2016, the border was militarized, and for the second time in recent history. And so it made it impossible to cross. You, the gates were closed. Um, it, it's really heartbreaking. Um, our executive producer said, you know, in our last Q and A, like what had happened, um, and, and even now, like that gate is still closed, um, and they they go to the border and they can they can't drive across, and so they just go to the border and their family members will come to the other side and they'll like talk at the gate and they drive okay. down to the gate twice a week where uh, you know back in the day they would be able to go and have lunch dinner. It's only twenty miles. It's a twenty minute drive, and and right. now they have to all the way around through a port of entry, which is like the whole customs process. And, and so it, it was heartbreaking. And I, and I wanted to tell this story from a child's perspective. There are so many similarities between Elsa and Anna and so many differences. I mean, on the mm-hmm. surface level, mm-hmm. it's like they don't speak the same language, but they bought, they really quickly have this deep bond um, um, because, you know, they're both indigenous. Uh, and, yeah. and that's like, it goes back to like all this history of, of uh, Latin America and, and how uh, you know colonization just kind of messed so much up yeah. there. So um, it's it's a uh, it's a story that I was so happy that we got the support to tell, um, mm-hmm. and um, I'm just so happy it's now out in the world and people who are from Mexico and from Arizona and Autumn are like commenting and stuff. It's really cool. That's great. That's great. Um... Did you ever, because I, I know, like you said, it's specifically a story about the border and the struggles with that. Was there ever a time, because I feel like it's possible to tell a similar story in a different setting. Was there ever a thought that maybe you would you would do this in a different setting and try to tell a similar story? Um, There was a thought, and then it immediately was like, we I can't, because the story was just always so specifically like this specific place. Like it was mm-hmm. always cells. It didn't ever exist in any other iterations. Um, it was just always like the idea was specifically cells, specifically this this place. And that's why I wrote it in 2000, like 16, 17. And I didn't even try to make it till 2019 because okay. I just was like, who like who's gonna go how are they gonna go for this I mean I'm gonna have to I want to make it with them as a community I want the community members to be the actors I don't want you know it can't be transported even to like another nation it can't be plant transplanted into an- another state it's so specifically about the author language and the generational mm-hmm. differences between um you know Virginia who's this like author grandmother but she was born in Mexico so she knows English Spanish and author and so mm-hmm. that kind mm-hmm. of like it, it just couldn't be and so that's why I kind of sat on it for so many years until I just we essentially got the courage to just be like let's just see what they say you know um, yeah and luckily they were really receptive and in our first uh in our first meeting with them they ended up the passing a law to approve the film nice very nice um and then I was have you ever seen the Florida Project by Sean Baker yeah 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 I was there any inspiration from that film for for Burroughs because I I, um, I found connections between the two for sure. Yeah, I love Sean's work. Um, one of my favorite films of his is um, actually well, I love Tangerine, and that that to me was like such a inspirational film because it it was great for filmmakers. I think because since he just shot it on on you know you know iphones essentially Mm -hmm. i was like wow like you can actually tell a really compelling story um on on just uh, things you have lying like like lying around or in your own pocket so from that perspective um from the perspective of like how he's able to go out there and tell these really um meaningful and heartfelt and specific stories in in communities that don't often you know that that aren't often like sh- show, shown a spotlight on definitely mm. he's been an inspiration very cool uh, it, that's a film that i i actually just saw for the first time semi recently um a, a friend of mine who's a, a writer and director he 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 recommended the film and i'd never heard of it i had never heard of sean and 
it was a fantastic film and it just so happened that I got to see Burroughs not that long after. Oh, and, amazing. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I, I thought the connections were fantastic, but I was curious because I feel like in Sean's uh, The Florida Project, mm-hmm. those kids, you understand where they're coming from and you understand why they do the things that they do, but they play on both sides, both the antagonist and the protagonist throughout where right. I feel where you touch on that a little bit, but you're so firm on them being the protagonist in these how do you draw the line and make sure that you don't end up on the other side by accident well that's a good question um man i never thought about that from sean's movies but yes that's really true um and he also did you, have you seen starlet i have other not film? Starlet's have fantastic not. check that one out that's probably I my will. second um but yeah i think like a seminal film for me was um, was Beast of the Southern Wild, and mm-hmm. how that story and and, and how that story uh, was told so specifically from a child's perspective. And I remember watching so many of like the interviews, or reading the interviews, and 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 watching what Ben had to, had to say about how he did that. And one of the main things he said was like, "I always kept the camera at the children's eye level, and oh, yeah. we were never looking down." And so like. A lot of times, you know, if it's like an adult and a child in a scene, there's going to be a a huge difference between just the head, the headspace, right? In in terms of Mm -hmm. like elevation. And so a lot of times, like you'll just shoot like over the shoulder down and then over the shoulder up. And um, I remember thinking like, oh, wow, that's a really good way to ground the film specifically like from the kid's point of view. And that's something that we went in with, like with Cole, my cinematographer from the very beginning, we were like, whenever we are shooting them, we're always at their level. Like we're never looking down on them. Um, And so I think that's kind of a way to do it. Um, But that was uh, something that we really, we really, we really took care to, to do from a visual standpoint. Yeah, that was very cool. Um, I, I, that's not something that I picked up on, but now that you, now that you mentioned it for sure, that's very, that's a very cool and I guess simple way of doing it. Um, yeah. and it, and it works very well, obviously, because like I said, you, you remain on that one side of the line firmly throughout. Um, so it works very, very well. Um, and I think, we, and I think like, just to kind of talk on that a little bit, like we, there's so many complicated forces at play down there. There's so many, the politics are complicated there the solutions are complicated the solutions are not simple and so um that couldn't be the story like that couldn't be uh that really it, it was it's just too complicated for a 15 minute film it's even too complicated for like a, a feature film to that's like a documentary mm-hmm. or like a, a series that can and delve into all that or even just more mm-hmm. of like a research or something um but you know telling it just from these these two kids' perspective, it's like it's about friendship. It's about connecting with someone who doesn't speak the same language. It's about, you know, wanting to find a friend and like what it's like to just sort of like adventure. I mean, that was my childhood. We had a field and a river behind our house growing up in Texas. And that's how we spent our summers. We just like ran around and kind of got into trouble, got into trouble and stuff like that and built <laughs> stuff back there. And that's that was my childhood. And so I wanted to kind of like bring that into um into these two kids who just want to play no matter their circumstances and mm-hmm. and literally like throw all of the the complicated um forces like in the background the smuggling and the and like the border patrol and all that kind of stuff as the literal backdrop because that's how it is down there i mean when yeah when you go yeah. there that's what it's like you're very quickly like thrown into this like whoa you know this is different very cool um and then obviously the, the two leads you mentioned a few times they're both young girls what's it like casting two leads it's not just one it's not just one child that is feeding off an uh, feeding off an adult throughout um you have two young children that have to work off of one another what's it like casting them and making sure that they that you know that you can trust them throughout um it's like um the trust i think comes from casting the right people like once we had cast both of them I wasn't in that mindset of like oh no what if this doesn't work it was like mm-hmm. once we 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 search and we search and we search and then once we found them then I was like okay like it's gonna work because the the script is it's not improv like it's written there's you know one scene that is not a non-dialogue scene but that we kind of like had her just like run around which is the um you know in the convenience store but the rest mm-hmm. is scripted and so 
uh, for that to work, I feel like you need to cast people to play themselves, especially non-actors. And so this is like everyone in the film had acted for the first time. And that was like what I wanted. And everyone kind of played versions of themselves that were pre-written. And so we 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 wrote or I wrote this character of this sort of like troublemaking kind of like rambunctious kid. And a lot of kids out there uh, were, were quiet and um I was like, I know she's got to be out there. And we we found her uh, through her aunt um, was one of the founders who brought Toka back, the the sport that you see in the film. And so we went mm-hmm. out there, at, you know, after practice, it was dark to the Toka field and like did an audition there where Liz, who's also an actor and my producer, um, she did just this like scene with her and, uh, and Amaya just started bawling, you know, and I was like, wow. And she was, she was great. And so once you find that person, then that's where the trust, I think, can be built um, from there. Okay, cool. Because I, I always wonder, like, like how do you, I, I imagine that you have to trust yourself enough to make sure that, like, to know that you've made the right decision. But I always find, like, you poured your heart and soul into writing the script yeah. and to trust a group of people. I mean, it goes obviously beyond just the two leads. It goes to yeah. everyone else that's involved in it. To be able to trust that many people with your vision is is incredible to me it's this Um, like dance of control and like like letting things be you know yeah um and that's hard for me for sure you know you want to like make it exactly like it's in your head and a lot of that is in the casting but then Mm -hmm. i think you have to have this sort of belief uh and trust that it's going to work out. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Yeah. And to let them be themselves and to like, let them find things that are not in the script or like find different ways of doing things and not um, have this like stranglehold kind of, kind of thing on it. Um, it's sort of like a control and release sort of thing, but. Mm. I, I imagine you have to operate somewhat as a learner on set as well. Um, and I was, make- yeah. And just being there on the nation, like every day was a constant learning experience. I mean, I'm still learning things. Uh, about the nation I um, become close with Bear who's our EP I was just talking with him yesterday he stayed at my place a couple weeks ago and he's going to come back for another um, award show that we have coming up and so cool. yeah I was just uh, he'll call me I'll call him and I I'm like learn about you know different traditions like what they did for for Halloween and and how they handle Thanksgiving and all this stuff so it's been a multi-year constant learning experience which really has been meaningful to me that's really cool. I've, I've mentioned it before in, in other conversations. Um, I like to try to learn something new every day. And that like film gives me that. Um, yeah, even really films cool. that I've seen 15 or 20 times, there's always something that I don't know. Yeah. And I have to look it up. So that yeah. that's one of the things I love about film. Yeah, there's always and something I, you need to know or to learn. They're like, oh, I didn't see how they did that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even sitting down analyzing them, you, you still give me tidbits that I didn't pick up on when I when I watched. Um, so it's, it's fantastic. And, and it makes me appreciate the film even more when I learn these things. Thank you. Thank you. I try to put some detail. You know, I'm very detail oriented when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. And um, I try to put little things in there to give it more, a more like multi viewing richer experience, because that's what I love when I watch movies. Do you do you find that being that detail oriented uh causes you to struggle through the writing process at all um to me it's like and it's that kind of cliche thing but like a film is written three times right like you Mm -hmm. write it and then you rewrite it when you shoot because once you shoot it doesn't matter what's in the script like it literally doesn't matter because all you have is what you have in the can on film Mm -hmm. whatever and then uh you get to rewrite it again when in the editing process and so I try to like just get the script in a really good place, but knowing that things are going to change on set, like knowing that I, I I trust myself and the crew and the actors to be able to like kind of evolve. And if something is not working, then we rewrite it or we reshoot it or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm not too um, like once I know it's kind of like once I know the script is working, then I'm, you know, ready to move on to the next stages. And th- that's when you work with all your department heads and they come up with ideas and bring things in. And you just, you know, it's, it's, it, there's only so much that can be in your head. And it's like, once you are on the location yeah. and you just look around, you're in a physical space. Uh, it, it It's like so many more ideas come and things like that. Yeah. Cool. Because, yeah, like I said, I, I, I did struggle. I tried to write a script during COVID. 
and I didn't get very far. I'm like a page and a half in um, mm -hmm. because I found that I was trying to be so detail oriented that mm -hmm. I was tripping myself up and thinking that this wouldn't work and just constantly rethinking and trying to yeah. reinvent reinvent before it even existed. Yeah. Um, so that's cool no, I, that you're able to that you're yeah. able to understand how that works. It's hard. I don't anyone who says writing's easy is lying. Like it's hard every time. It's hard every time. And um yeah, it's just like that first draft, just get it out. Like yeah. just don't worry about the details because you're probably gonna come to the end of it and realize it's about something totally different than what you set out to be to to have it be, and then you'll end up rewriting it, which is like what happened with the feature version of this. Um it got totally rewritten and is now, you know, about something completely different than what mm -hmm. I originally set out to make it. So that's, I right. think that's the, the, the game and it's hard, it's heartbreaking and it's really hard. I, I had a conversation uh, with, with a filmmaker and he had said, and I, I tend to agree with him on, for, for the most part, that short films tend to have scenes that don't need to be in it. Like a short film can always be shorter. And yeah. I didn't feel that way with this. Um, oh. I felt I I felt like everything had a place. Um, how do you make sure that you're not adding things that you like rather than things that work? Um, listen to people who give you feedback. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a scene that we had to cut, and that was like very hard for me to realize that. Mm -hmm. um but then once it was like missing and then we watched it without we're like oh don't need that scene because a previous scene gave that same information that same emotion that that we needed to push to the next uh mm -hmm. like kind of story mm -hmm. moment and it was repetitive and so um as heartbreaking as it was to lose that scene because it had so many people in it that i was like oh I, I love these people we need to show them and everything like that and um it it just it worked so much better without so that was my editor that was my producer that was you know other directors who i sent it to um who are like multiple people telling you the same thing you know yeah might be true so that's tough it's tough it's <laughs> tough because i'm tied to it you know i want it i want that everything to be in there so yeah i'm one of those people that likes just likes to be right and i <laughs> imagine <laughs> i imagine someone telling me that that scene that you wrote and put in your film is not is not going to work. I, yeah. I think I would trouble, I, I would have trouble dealing with that. Um, I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes that, the changes and like, you know, sometimes it's just, it's all gets, it's just like, like I was saying that like, you know, that scene worked amazing. Like in the script, it was necessary. Like as you're reading yeah. the script, completely necessary. Once we shot it, edited it, put it in, it was like, oh, this is a double beat. So then, you know, you have to lose it because especially with shorts, they're online they've got to, you know. Yeah. And, and I think it, I think it's okay to be uncomfortable with that stuff. I, I don't think that's a, a knock on someone's character to, uh, yeah. to not want to cut certain things. Uh, yeah. I think that's okay. Too. <laughs> I, think that's okay. Um, I think it's very human and very normal. Yeah. There was, there was one scene in particular. Um, it's when the two girls walk off screen and the camera just kind of freezes and there's, there's a, few second pause before you see anything move again and you see other people come onto screen mm -hmm. and there was a moment there where i thought well what the hell happened to my computer why did it freeze why like what's going on right now yeah. and i think it made me very anxious and yeah. i think but i think it worked the way it was supposed to why did you choose that way to be to tell like to show emotion in that moment rather than i'm sure there's millions of other ways you could have done it but why did you feel that this was the most effective? So this is going to sound weird, but that was actually that that scene and it kind of a lot of the shooting style was um, really inspired by this episode of Barry. Uh, it was the okay. episode that. Um, um, what's his name? Dire the, 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 who plays Barry directed. He actually directed this episode. Um, and yeah, it was like, space ago. I think it was, um, in the middle of the season, you know, all shows kind of have that like one episode sometimes that just like completely breaks the convention of the normal directing. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of those episodes and, um, the way that he moved the camera where things would like come in and out of frame not necessarily following the characters or following the action, but really it was like, put, it put you in the place that it was set so much 
uh, so much more. And it gave me this like just anxiety, <laughs> like watching it. It's yeah. such a break from how we think about film and storytelling. It's like the, you know, the camera should follow the characters. The camera, you know, should stick with um, the characters. And so I, I wanted to do it that way to physically link the proximity of where these kids physically are with like where this activity physically is and mm. sometimes uh it's right there and by not breaking through an edit by not like cutting I felt like it um you know every time you cut your brain sort of subconsciously like gets to relax you know because it's just like oh now I'm looking at a new image it's a new mm. thing that I'm processing now new colors new characters and if you don't cut you have to you're forced to stay there in the moment and your brain for whatever reason just like doesn't like let you break away and so um it's sort of like cutting is like blinking and so that was just like a way to keep us there to show the proximity and um to to really like make us feel and stay in that moment okay and I, it kind of reminded me a little bit of if you've seen daredevil on netflix it oh is that a show or the feature yeah yeah it's a it's a show um the 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 superhero daredevil uh yeah. that yeah that operates in hell's kitchen there is like the infamous uh hallway fight scene where they don't cut and he travels very slowly down this hallway with like 35 bad guys attacking him and there are oh, moments man. when he when he ends up behind the camera and you see nothing except for like bodies on the ground and yeah. then all of a sudden someone's thrown back into frame it reminded me very much of that that's awesome. I yeah, love and, that. and it it works in the same way. If if you are in any way a superhero fan, you have to watch that. I'll have to check that out. That's like the scene in Old Boy where he's like, "Have you seen that scene in Old Boy, the original one?" God, I like, haven't. I have not seen. I have not yeah. seen it. I, that one, he doesn't go behind the camera, but it is surreal. It's a weird feeling. It's like when you're sitting in a theater and watching a play, and a character comes from behind you down the yeah. aisle. Mm -hmm. totally disorienting and really surreal it's yep. a little scary and so like having those characters kind of come from behind hearing the footsteps first uh mm -hmm. there's just a little, something a little unsettling about that because there's something a little unsettling about that whole scene and so um and surreal about that scene and so i think that was kind of our thinking as well with the sound design okay very cool again if you are a superhero fan at all you have to <laughs> check you have to check right, that series I'll, out I'll put it on my list to watch they, they to watch. are uh they are rebooting the daredevil series uh because oh. now now it's all part of the mcu and stuff like that so wow but th this was uh this was a rated r superhero show oh wow okay all right yeah, yeah I'll have to check out. um yeah and very very well done um and then you mentioned earlier uh that Burroughs is now available for free, at least for a short amount of time online. Yeah. Where can people find that? So we are online. We're on YouTube and Vimeo. We got staff picked on Vimeo yesterday, which was uh, amazing. Nice. It was like a, like a, a, I've never gotten a staff pick. It was my, you know, kind of bucket list that sort of like dream, dream to have happen. It was amazing. And we're also on Vimeo or on um, Amaletto on YouTube in there okay. for your consideration section, because we, are qualified for the Oscars this year. And so nice. we are hoping that something good happens in that regard. And they are helping us and supporting us, um, putting us in that on that section of their channel. Really, really, mm -hmm. really nice of them. Very cool. I'm making it a point every year now to watch all of the Oscar nominated films. So I'm glad that I got to watch this as early as I did. Cause I spent like last January to February watching like 75 films, trying to catch up that I hadn't seen. Um, oh my gosh wow yeah <laughs> it, it was like multiple ones a day or did you yeah i watch at least one film every day wow like um, today currently you would watch one film a day or back or back yeah i get yeah still um i i'm yeah. up I, I don't have to be to work until about 6 45 but i get up at four so i have time to watch oh my um, God, you're an all -star. That's awesome. <laughs> i watch i watched like half of blonde this morning and then I ran out of time because it's almost a three hour film. Oh no. Yeah. Um, I need to do that. Yeah, I, I need it. it. It was such a big deal. I need I feel like I need to watch it. And I'm falling behind on those. I'm watching a lot of indie things and short films and which I love. It's not a knock on them whatsoever, but I I gotta watch some of those bigger things that everyone's talking about and I have no idea what's going on. Stay in the conversation. Yeah. For sure. Uh 
And then I, I want to make a random comment. Um, yeah. I, I don't want you to take this offensively at all because I mean it in the best possible way. You are not at all what I expected aesthetically. It's such a mature film that I, I expected I expected someone so much older. No, I know. I, I get that a lot. I uh yeah, I don't know. My girlfriend met me. I mean, we've been we just celebrated our our one year anniversary like oh, once. And she goes, uh, you know, when I met you, I thought you were 26. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> well, that's working for or against me, but um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I get that a lot. I had a beard. <laughs> I kind of shaved it that kind of helps but it doesn't come in very well so <laughs> yeah. I just I work with what I got <laughs> well I, I got that for a little while and then all you know all the hair went so that doesn't I don't get that so much anymore <laughs> <laughs> you know you got to work with what you got and yeah um, it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day yeah um but I, again I mean that in the best possible way because yeah. it's because it's so mature um you, you seem like you have 30 years in the business based just based oh, on what God. i saw yeah thank you so much of uh, course and then thank you for watching yeah yeah um and then i'm curious what you're you're working on now so i have a few things we are working on getting a feature version of this made not the same story like totally different story different time period but set in the same world um so we're hoping that um you know we get enough kind of like fans and people talking about this film and sharing it which has like already happened in the last 48 hours I've been getting all these amazing messages from people who are telling me personal stories of how they're connected to this area so I think there's a real like um it's a story that hasn't been told and so expanding this world into a feature is my next um is, is next on the list and also working on a um um a docu-series um that features the sport Thoka, which is an all-girls sport and <clears throat> and having the episodes directed by indigenous di directors i'm losing my voice having the episodes directed by indigenous directors and um and making that kind of a a, a docu-series that's focused on on the sports it's so fascinating we can go into it the next time i talk to you very cool uh, well i look forward to those best of luck on those I won't make you talk too much longer. I just have one more question for you because I ask everybody and I love I love the responses I get. And I always feel like a fool because they say things that I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> what, are, what are some of your favorite films? Um, my favorite, favorite film is 2001, The Space Odyssey. Okay. Um, that movie is just awesome. I've been able to see that in the theater in 70 millimeter. And wow. it has wow. a completely different effect than the first time I saw it as a kid on the TV. Um, and that is Stanley Kubrick's my you know my favorite director, and that's a film that I um, have I have always loved. Another film is Hard Eight, which is um, yeah. ETA's first film that he made. Uh, that film has been really influential. No one has found it yet, but there is a direct visual reference to. Uh, Heart Eight and um and Burroughs there's in in one scene I like straight up just copy this one lighting effect um but I think it's so I think I made it too subtle that no one's picked up on it um which is kind of cool and so yeah and then I this year I saw some incredible films I saw everything everywhere all at once that was so I haven't good seen that but I've heard such oh good things God. that movie broke me that movie was amazing and then I love Tar which I just saw uh, at a okay. screening and that yeah. was just fantastic the acting and the direction and just the way that like it's lit and it's it's really subtle but it's just fantastic filmmaking just like the craft of that film is just top notch it's excellent who's the lead in that Kate Blanchett yes okay I, I knew it was a female lead I don't know why I was yeah I was I forget who I was thinking but yeah that wasn't who I was thinking so it's amazing to see a film that has such a like singular performance and is known for the performance, but then is also directed in this way that just it, it's just like matches it. It's usually mm -hmm. kind of like not usually you don't usually typically see both of those happening at the same time. Yeah. And um, that film is is excellent. I'd highly recommend that. Very cool. I will check those out. I'll I'll check out Hard Eight and I'll see if yeah. I can figure out what the reference is. Yeah, watch Hard Eight. I love that. <laughs> film. It's excellent. Excellent. I will. And then I'll try to get the uh, the review posted tonight. So by the time this video comes out, it, it should be posted. and Everyone will have something to reference when we're talking about this fantastic film. Amazing. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for doing that.
of course, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to sit down with me and chat about Burroughs. Uh, once again, guys, uh, make sure that you check out Burroughs online. I will post some links on the video so you guys can find it. Again, this is Jefferson, and thank you again so much for your time. Thank you so much, Kyle. Of course. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.